The reason you're shitty at marketing is because you think you have a fan base, but you don't. You have different containers within that. Mm. And the whole goal is to, before the input reaches the outflow, intervene on the container and bring it to another one that's more valuable to you. In all of business, it's that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it basically is. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to Creative Juice. I am your host, Circa, and this week uh, I am without Corinne because I wanted to get a chance to talk to a member of our community who's been in it for some time, and I've had the chance to talk to you before. In fact, we tried to record this podcast before, but the file got corrupted, but it was just such an amazing talk that I'm super happy to be doing it again, and this gentleman is you know, a pretty big media buyer in the digital marketing space, but also has had the opportunity to work with lots of musicians. So please welcome Tom Davenport. How's it doing, Tom? Oh, good, Carl. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I'm super psyched. Um, you know, I, I wanted a chance to kind of get your journey, but also your thoughts on digital marketing, because last time you know, we revealed so much about sort of thinking about this challenge that is you know, approaching marketing an entertainer of some sort or marketing someone who's going to command a large fan base, but also just the nuts and bolts of digital and, you know, how it kind of changes you as a, as a person a little bit. So I wanted to start off by just kind of getting a, a walkthrough of how you got to where you are today. Cause I know that you started off like wanting to be an engineer. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, it was. Um, so like a lot of musicians um particularly my generation um the obvious thing is you you know you you're in a band as teenagers and it's like okay gotta go to college oh, i'll do the music thing and then you're at university because it's kind of the done thing everyone goes to university and um, not everyone but you know a lot, a lot of people in the uk would get loans or whatever and go to universities for lifestyle and then you go oh i'm gonna uh, do engineering because it's you know there's you know couldn't play a proper like orchestral instrument or anything, but right, so all the rock right. people would get into engineering. Um, so we did like record production. And then the obvious thing is to become, you know, to, to work in a studio or to run a studio. And um, so that was like my big goal. And I mean, I can get into it if you want, but there was a bit of a story of how I did manage to secure funding to start a studio and start running that. But also in particular, uh, with a community focus on free recording for young people, uh, which was actually a youth centre that I originally started at, and that, um, and so like my, you know, it was uh, an interesting sort of punk and DIY scenes and really community focus um, that kind of got me into that. But then I kind of that was kind of like I'd already ticked that goal then by like 20, 20, 21, 22. So that's where I started, and then you know I suppose the short version of the history since is that I. I took that interest in engineering and music and try, you know, almost like the beginners, the, the beginner end of being in the business of music, the very beginner end uh, to the point that I wasn't charging. It was like free recordings. Like, Oh, no wonder that didn't last. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, that and the love for the internet has kind of slowly converged. And that along with being in the Twitter era, you know, cause this was 2008 or nine sort of that all this happened. Then it's all like, completely unexpectedly ended up being that we do like quite big media buying projects for the entertainment business, including a lot of sort of music and, fil and film work. So, uh, yeah. yeah, funny journey that I did not initially plan, but it did take, you know, you, you, you know, look, it took a bit of looking forwards and, a, yeah, and, and yeah, so yeah, thankfully it all came together, which, uh, as a young musician doesn't always feel like it will, but yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we have relatively similar similar trajectories in terms of culture, um, maybe in slightly different ways. But I think that like, and this is something that happens a lot in digital marketing, where like a lot of great digital marketers are like former formerly in a band or formerly were a comedian, mm. and in both of those avenues, you know, you grow up with this counterculture that kind of is anti capitalist. Like com for comedians, it's Bill Hicks and like his hatred of marketers. For musicians, it's like the punk scene and the folk scene and all these other scenes that were sort of like skeptical of 
just like everything that it takes to become an entrepreneur, you know? Um, so it's, it's always interesting to see that shift because for me, I look back and I, I, I know that I was anti all this stuff, but it's crazy to me that I, that I didn't understand how well suited for it or how much I would like it once I got into all of it. It's, it's, you, you started off very like, fuck the system, right? <laughs> like, yeah. It's, and I don't think, it sounds like you, you were the same. And I don't think we're yeah. alone in that. And actually, as you said that, like, it's, I suppose the like, theory is dawning on me because I, I'll start with my perspective, but it makes, I, I see this other people that I know, uh, particularly in the music business, seem to have come from a punk background. In fact, yeah. I have a peer who has a company very similar to mine, and he's also all about, you know, his background was all about the kind of Washington, D.C. hardcore punk scene and, you know, Fugazi and Minutemen and uh rights to spring and all that and 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 i and i'm thinking about hang on there's people that like quite big you know the people that um you know um label services companies and stuff that i can think of that kind of came from that background too and i I wonder if maybe it's 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 being born from a a kind of fuck the system approach which turns into i'm going to do this independently approach which then ends up being okay i'm having to figure out and learn this stuff and own my own stuff and then that ends up being, oh, you're an expert in that. And it's like, oh, wait, you're now the most qualified person for the system. How funny is that? Right. That happens all the time. There's a lot of people like that. I, I think that it comes from this place of like, as an independent musician or as a child of like disturbing circumstances, you you become this sort of like, um, I can't do, I can't control anything about my environment. It's all controlled for me. Mm. And I hate that. And I'm going to rail against that. But that doesn't mean that like you're against anything necessarily except for not being able to kind of have command a control over like your life or, you know, what you want to do or your dream. Like once you start to get a control over it, I don't know that that means that you're the system. I think you maybe misunderstood it early on or I don't know. It's, it's hard to find that like balance between who you were and who you've become. You yeah. Know? I think it's a will for independence. Yeah. And, but it just happens to be that a will for independence actually starts to arm you with skills to then function independently and then function at higher levels. And, and yeah, maybe something about that stacks up that then suddenly you'll, you know, maybe it gives you good odds of being more, uh, more in demand. Um, and what was your background? I'm interested. Where did you, where did you start with, with, with this? Um, I, I, you know, I had a rough childhood. Uh, and so I was a bit of an outcast. I was, you know, as a fat kid and like, I listened to like old soul records and like hip hop and I didn't really fit in very well. And so I start, I hung out with the wrong crowd because it was the only crowd that I could hang out with. And I got into the music of the wrong crowd and I started having my own independent experiences that people in my peer class weren't. Um, so like I would, you know, like my, fr my people in my high school would be like at their friend's house in town and I'd be like three towns away at like a hotel party of some sort, you know? <laughs> so like, that's what my childhood was like. At 12, I got into music and then I just started doing that hip hop and like didn't really care about school. And then when it came time for college, like I didn't graduate high school until I was almost 20 years old. It took me six years. I stayed back like twice um, for all for attendance reasons. And, and then I, when it came time for college, it was like, I have to go to college. I want to go to full sale. I'm worried I won't get in, but full sales actually, you just sign up and go. So I was delighted to find that out. And I got there and I was like, oh, um, this kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> like I didn't really like it that much. Um, at first I met a few co really cool teachers. And then when I got out of it, I was like, I started working like shitty sales jobs and I was just like, I hate all this. So even if I'm going to starve, I'm going to do music related things. So then I became the manager of a recording studio, little project studio in, uh, here in town. And then from there, springboarded to everything else that I that I currently do in the music industry. Met all the people that I that I kind of grew out of it with. So yeah, but you also you started a recording studio, and I don't want to glaze over that because you you did that out of the out of that spirit, out of the spirit of like people don't ha uh, people who I care about and identify with 
don't have control or can't augment their scenario because I, and I also can't. And that, that was kind of, it seems like that's your first exercise in being like, let me stretch out and see how much I can control or what I can do. Right. Mm. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I should get a little into it because it was, it was this really important formative period where the right intentions, but also a bit of fortunate education from the internet put me in good stead and, you know, it built certain, I could have never predicted that these were bricks and foundations that everything else I've done since have been built upon. So, um, so, I mean, just to set the scene, this is a time when marketing is not on my radar. Right. The, the, The thing I always remember was watching Bill Hicks probably is like, years before it's maybe, I don't know if it was a university or as a teenager, but Bill Hicks saying, you know, all marketers should die and it's easy to adopt that. It's like, yeah, fuck marketers. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> so it just wasn't on my radar. It wasn't cool. Um, as far as I was concerned, it just wasn't even on my radar. Okay. So what I did want to do is say, I wanted to be a recording engineer because it felt like, you know, technical, um, it was about music. I felt like there's an art to it. I kind of got, like, I've always kind of been drawn to the art of technical activities um, if you, is that, is that the right? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you, you can have, it's probably like how a coder could see sort of an art and beauty in the way that certain things are structured. For example, it's like, okay, I, think I like technical skills that do that. There's, there's something about that in becoming a marketer. Like mm. I, you know, I was the same way. There are some subjects for which I can open a hundred browser tabs and spend every night for months learning. And marketing was one of those filmmaking, like little, you know, tweaky, like oh, I can, I can do these little things like, cause as a dad, that's always interesting. If you were reading just some like basic operations manual with like step one, step two, step three, I mean, maybe there is, a, there, there could be a joy in that, but I think it's the, the fact that, you know, the fields you just mentioned, they have this kind of inherent depth because there's not one way to do it. And that's where the art and creativity comes from it. And I can't wait to get, and you know, this will be a great topic when we get into the ad side, because, you know, there's nothing like that kick you get of like this beautifully structured campaign where it kind of, the audiences kind of wrap around themselves and there's kind of like nice clear rules about how stuff behaves, but it kind of can and it's uh, yeah I think this is something we've like really explored is how you can have a, a campaign structure that self organizes audiences and there's there's just such a kick out of like figuring that out and then seeing it kind of play out and it's so it's basically in a technical environment being able to explore sort of creativity and then sort of see it come together it's just absolutely awesome so anyway, I think that's why I was drawn to recording engineering anyway least of all because it was it seemed like the only way to monetize you know uh, being a musician is you know, having been a sort of in bands as a teenager. Um, so, so here's, so here's the scene. I'm at university. I've done my final year and I then have our first son before I even graduate. So I'm like, okay, if I want to do this music thing, I better figure this stuff out. Okay. Because it's like, if I don't figure out now, I'm going to have to figure something else out. Okay. Like, yeah. and then you think, okay, the fullback is I'm going to do another career. You say to your girlfriend, let me just give me this six months. Just give me this year, whatever. It's like, this is what I want to do. Okay. I'm going to work it out. Um, God bless my wife having any faith in me. Cause you know, if I'd heard that, I'd been like, you ain't, you ain't doing that. Um, yeah. so, so what I did is I, um, there was a youth club that I, I had learned to play drums in and, you know, where my band used to practice. And it was an awesome, it was a really, it, it, it's important because it was, it was, there's a lot of youth clubs as they're called in the UK that are maybe trash. They're not well funded. Maybe not, uh, maybe they're not all great, but we had a really good one. When I was growing up as a teenager, it was this, um, there was this really inspired, um, really decent adults who kind of set up this environment for us to kind of learn and have fun. And it all sounds a bit um, airy fairy, but it, it was actually awesome all the way down to, they had N64s with golden eye. So we'd all run there. We would also be able to go there at school. It was by our school. So we could go there at lunch times. But then we had this environment that we could learn to record in and to play drums. And it was like that we built like we built our identities around that. And and so that experience, along with learning about the DC punk scene and basically, and if anyone hasn't heard about Discord Records and you know how um how US punk kind of it wasn't just in DC, but you know, Discord was the label in DC. And so 
bands like Fugazi. And so my musical heritage, just a quick tangent, was at the drive-in, changed my life. And then I worked backwards from through sort of punk and hardcore back to like the 80s, which taught me about DC. Now, when I read about how they how they'd be like, they had this whole operation. It was totally independent. They had their own label. In one corner, they're, you know, writing songs. In another corner, they're drawing the artwork. In another corner, they're cutting out the cases or whatever. In another, they're stamping, putting stamps on the, you know, and, and getting ready to post it. And then, you know, they had a decent studio right. um, nearby that had quality recording. I forget the name of it, but there was like a studio that like did, I mean, you list the Figazi albums and stuff. Not just them, but, you know, they're classic example. And it's the engineering is awesome. Like you can, it's like this really, really quite often aggressive, quite often intelligent and emotional kind of music. Yeah. Um, but it was recorded really well. So it didn't matter that they were teenagers. Like they, they had the passion. So that came through in the music. It was engineered well. And so one of the things I studied at university, um, there's a few cool topics actually that like studying viruses and stuff that, that was really formative for me. But one of the things was studying what ingredients made that scene function and, w- and why did they become so influential? Because it's not just that they're independent and having fun in DC in the eighties. It's that their influence rippled throughout most of Western music culture right up to today. So here's examples of people who were sat in the crowd watching Bad Brains and Fugazi and stuff in the eighties. Dave Grohl, uh, Mobig, you know, it's like there's this there's just character after character that was influenced by, that culture so it's like okay what if you designed an environment or scene in order to spur that kind of culture again today yeah and so one of the important ingredients was a studio and so i was like right that's the piece i'm going to play in that community and so that was that was the the vision and so we set free recording and it was an awesome experience and and I think, I mean, rather than elaborate on that, there's a cool article that I wrote years ago, um, but was published on, it's just a little site called starticus.net. But if you Google how to start a community recording studio, I think it's the top result there. And it's basically like the story of how, how we did that and like kind of what happened from it. And, and basically trying to like a call to arms to say, you can own your own kind of local music culture. And, and um, oh, oh, I, I mean... I suppose just to round that up, um, it was important because it, it teaches you independence, running that and dealing with not just bands, but also dealing with our local council, so our local government, um, taught me a lot. Okay. Um, one cool example was actually understanding how money works. And, and I mean, like literally how money flows like politically. Okay. So rather... So here's what we did. To start the studio, I raised £25,000, which is like $35,000 in a month. And I did that, not through fundraisers, and we didn't have Indiegogo or Kickstarter or whatever back then. Um, What I did is I started to understand who has the money, okay? Who has that purse string? Because if I can get – this isn't a customer, but imagine if you're running a business and you could have – 10,000 customers who are going to give you five pounds, or you could have one customer who's going to give you 500,000 pounds. It's like, okay, well, they're both viable, but you know, the route I went was to both. Pardon? There's pros and cons to both. There's pros and cons, but you could do both. But you know, um, as a, you know, I basically didn't have 500,000 people who would give us a fiver to start a studio. Right. Right. So I did figure out who had, who had the bigger purse. And so, uh, I, I stopped without going into detail. I figured I started through talking to people, just figured out the dynamics of money within the council because we had these two councils merging. It feels like so. I, I, I'm probably going to sound way cleverer than I am. Okay, it was a bit. It was very fortuitous that I even kind of inserted myself in this. But we had two councils merging. The one that was merging into the bigger one had lots of money. The bigger one was losing all its money in Iceland because this is the crash. I don't know if you remember, but I, like loads of people had stocks in Iceland that were paying 10% a year and instantly they crashed and everyone lost loads of money that was in the Iceland economy or something like that, okay? Yeah. yeah. So the bigger council had lost loads of money, had no funding, government starting to make major cuts. The small council was merging in, but they didn't want all their spare money to just go on the debts. So the guy who was writing the checks to try and put it into community initiatives 
really liked what I was trying to do because it was genuinely sort of, you know, community first, help with youth development. He just, and I asked for 20,000 and he gave us 25. It was like, amazing. And so there we were, gave myself a 5K salary, which is nothing, especially when you have kids. Yeah. And, uh, and then I spent, and, and then I figured out how to kind of buy that equipment. We had awesome kit. We had like Shadow Hills preamps. We had a really nice, not a big one, but it's like an Allen and Heath something 16, like just nice analog desk. We had awesome mics. Uh, it was absolutely awesome. So awesome. Um, but alongside that, kind of getting into Twitter, planted the seeds for the the wider music network because people really liked what I was doing. And so in the music community, it's like, yeah, okay, cool. We're getting behind you. We like that you're kind of trying to spur up some community. And so I started making some connections who little did I know, although they worked in music, they were maybe more entry level. Little did I know, eight, you know, five, eight, ten years later, they would become much more notable players in the music business and actually ultimately become my clients today. So that was a big lesson in like Dude, you know, accidental it, networking. Um, in the studio that I ran, um, I, in college, I met a gentleman who also is a big participant in the studio that I ran. He became a publicist and for his first job, for his first project as a manager, which he was trying to transition into, he took an intern from our studio and brought him to like national touring level on all the festivals for that year before he burned out a little bit. Mm. A gentleman who was my roommate, Tyler Yahweh, now on tour with Post Malone, like worldwide. So like, just, it's, cr you can never, especially when you get into an environment where there's lots of creatives around you and some of them are really good, like, you can't put a cap on where they're going to go. You never know. Yeah, they're committed to this path. So it's like, well, wh yeah. what is the trajectory of someone who commits to a certain sector? It's like, well, they're going to kind of climb in seniority and experience. And it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean by position in a company, though it might. Um, maybe in this kind of more creative sector, it might be, um, you know, that their network develops and then they introduce you. To so, you know, I, I, I even think this today. Like, I feel, I, I'm quite conscious of trying to still plant seeds today because – if I'm working with, say, a music management company and I have a relationship with the directors and, you know, I've built trust with them and that's great and that's really important because they are the buyer, okay? They're signing the checks. They're the one who, you know, who me and them are kind of working on the vision for what, you know, maybe their company can do digitally for their artists. So that's important. But the seeds are being planted with the executive level people that I'm working with day to day because those people might be, say, the in-house sort of social or digital person that I'm helping train or work with. But what are they going to be doing in two years or five years or 10 years? They're going to be moving into those director levels. They're going to have that history and relationship with me and my company. And so it's, you know, never, not that a decent person would do this, but never turn your nose up at, you know, the small person in the team. It's like, totally like that. Yeah. Look out for people like that. And they'll, they'll remember that. And, you know, I, th I think that's really important that, this is not a short-term game. Like people who play short-term games, they don't do anything important. When you deal with much, when you're dealing with um, you know, particularly the director level kind of business people, they are all about long game. They really, they get, they, 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 they disregard short games if they, if they have any sense. Okay. They're right. always about long yeah. game. I think you got, you got, you know, sometimes it's as simple as building that relationship with the, the passionate person who's still at that entry or intermediate level. I think it's really important. It's, yeah, I found it almost by accident, but it, you know that, that those Twitter connections becoming proper, and you know, music management and you know, clients to me. I mean, God, like I wouldn't if I didn't plant those seeds by accident by being kind of on Twitter and contributing to the scene and kind of sharing news. Like God, like I mean, where would I be now? I don't know. And that network is proven really valuable. Yeah, I think that there is like a few things about that story that kind of t tie into the the overall journey that you've had. And certainly I've had and a lot of people out there have had, which is like, okay, I'm powerless. I'm oppressed. And I don't like the system because I don't understand it. And it's oppressing me. Then you get into a position where you can enact change. And you were in a place of judging the system and judging the operatives of that quote unquote system, which is obviously as is, is definitionless. It doesn't exist, but you know, it's just a blanket term you can use for that which is oppressing you. And then you get to that level where you actually run something or you're you're at the helm of something and you start to learn a little bit about what it's like. And you start to see, oh, I see where some of these behaviors that I abhor may have come from uh, as abhorrent as they are. Mm. Um, but also 
you're predisposed to one, uh, have a bit of a scarcity mindset. So that thing you said about, you know, finding that person and understanding how money flows. I so identify with that because sometimes I've, I've, I've given someone advice before where I said, money is like a stream. It's all around you. You need to put your hand out and start. If you want money, just start, put your hand out. People can't, there's no vehicle by which people can give you money right now, but don't put money on a pedestal. Just create the vehicle Mm -hmm. and it will come. And to some people that can be offensive. If you're living in poverty, that can be like, what do you mean? Put your hand, money's a stream, shut up. But it's like, no, like, like there's an, like for a lot of people, money is not as serious as it is to you. And they have budgets that they need to spend by the end of the year. They have, you know, they have this chunk of money that they need to invest or need to give to a charitable donation. And they, it's more of a burden to them than it is like something they're trying to protect. And so, yeah, like that's, that was a huge realization for me to a degree when I got into business marketing. Yeah. Well, you've touched on a couple of, I don't think it should be lost in list. There's a couple of really powerful concepts there. And actually I think, I think I can explode on some detail on, on that. Yeah. So actually, I, I want to talk a little about systems. And I don't mean in the way that you suggested where, you know, system as the name for corporate Western world. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking, I want to talk very literally about systems, um, but briefly, because I could very easily get in the weeds in it. So, but look, a system is essentially, <clears throat> there's some sort of, stock or state okay so let's say a bathtub right it, it can hold water it can hold zero water it can hold let's say 100 percent of its capacity in water okay you have an inflow you have the which is a tap you have a plug which is an outflow okay so every system can actually be broken down to th- those basic constituent parts okay now in the real world the systems become so complex because there's so many chains of these you know, kind of micro systems. It's thousands of inputs and thousands of containers and thousands of outputs. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's yeah. ridiculous. Okay. But it's super, it, it, they, they can, you can zone in on a small part of it and understand what, what's the flow in and what's the flow out. Okay. Now that sounds not very actionable, but let me just, let me just now take that and apply it to the sort of metaphor you've given because you're saying, and you've used money. Money's not the only thing that flows, but let's just use that example. Money is flowing around in the economy in trillions and trillions and trillions of ways, okay? And so what you said is money is flowing, put your hand out. Now, on a practical engineering level, what you're doing is you're basically, you're siphoning off some existing flow, okay? Now, actually, let me just turn this, because I think some people might be turned off by thinking in terms of money on here. Let's talk in terms of audience in Facebook, okay? Right. Let's say, <laughs> yeah. let's say there's a pool of people out there. So the stock, let's say you've got an interest on Facebook. Okay. And the interest is, let's say Fugazi. All right. Okay. Let's say there's people interested in Fugazi. That's a stock. Okay. And Facebook is going to be identifying more people. There's an influence. And then some people might not be um, posting about or interacting with or whatever Fugazi. So they'll be flowing out right. of it. Okay. In fact, a better example might be a warm audience, like, you know, website visitors okay right it's got an end date so people end up being too far away from the time at which they visited your website so they flow out exactly so so they they kind of fall off that cliff if they haven't been back to the site so the stock is oh okay i've had ten thousand people on my website in the last six months and so the inflow is whatever traffic i'm getting who let's assume everyone doesn't use an ad blocker so you, you have an inflow and you want that inflow to outweigh the outflow of people not going on your website. And so, in fact, there's two things you could do there, okay? What you could do is you could increase the inflow, but you could also increase the retention of people within that pool. So let's say you have 10,000 people go on your website. You could be retargeting viewers of the website um, in order to get them back to the site so that that six-month timer, and I assume your audience understands this because your course is excellent and it talks about this sort of thing, but um, if you go on the website, for six months, you'll be in the warm audience for the website visits up to six months, right? right? 180 days or something like that. So so if you can um, stop that attrition, which is people leaving the pool, then 
you go, then great, you're growing that warm audience, okay? And you could apply this to every, every warm audience, but let's just talk in terms of website, okay? So if people are, we can retain audience so they're not leaking out, so we're going to retarget the visitors. And we're going to create an inflow of people into website audience. So you're actually growing that pool, okay? Now, your, your example with hand put the money out, it's like, okay, you're basically Imagine, uh, imagine a, a network of streams and rivers and pools, okay? Imagine you've just dug a pool, you've got a dirt pit, right? And how are you going to get the flow of whatever currency, be it money, be it audience? How are you going to get that, well, in this case, water? How are you going to get that water in your pool? You dig a channel off an existing stream, okay? So what we're doing when we're advertising is Facebook has – this absolute tsunami of audience, okay? And we're siphoning that off, okay? And we're siphoning off, and if, you know, there's gonna be a rate at which that audience will come through. And so that's why we use targeting and messaging to increase relevance, because then that conversion rate or click-through rates is gonna be, you know, is, is the throughput in your system, okay? So I, I'm gonna just, I, I could try and round up on systems, okay? Just because I could talk about all day, but it, it is that simple. You're basically, it's like an engineer. If I'm building an engine in a car, you know, what's the throughput of petrol into this stock where it burns it and then converts it to energy? Well, if I increase the throughput of fuel, then it's going to increase the output of energy. So it's like, okay, right. what do you want to happen? I want to sell 1,000 of my band's EP. Okay, what needs to exist for that to happen? You need... And you should literally just do this with – I've got loads of posters up there doing exactly this for something much less interesting. Uh, but anyway, um, so you'd be like, right, post it. Here's the outcome I want. What do I need for that to happen? I need inflow of money to check out. What do I need for that to happen? I need inflow of people to check out from product page. Okay, and then you start getting multiple sources because it doesn't have to be one linear stream. You're starting to think in terms of, okay, I could – rather than have throughput of one, um, you know – home page to product page, I can go, what other in-streams can I have? I could have an in-stream of display ads, or I could have an in-stream of people um, coming through from YouTube ads. And so you're increasing the throughput by increasing the channels even going in. You're creating more inflows to the same container. And I think the reason that the systems are complex in the real world is because for every container of a system, there is an interception where that's the inflow to someone else's system. So, mm. it, you know, you you saw the container of this committee budget and you said, I need to create an interception yeah, to create yeah. an inflow to my own container. But now you, the studio, has their own container and some gear company is like, how do we intercept his container? Or they might think of everyone who owns a studio as one big container and they're trying to create an inflow from there. Yeah. So it's like, that's why they get complex is because for every container, there's an intercepting inflow. Yeah. That And so that's why they're all integrated. It all moves in in a big miraculous symphony. And, and there's a couple of, ing so, so th there's actually one final ingredient that I didn't say. Okay. And this is super important. So every, every system actually has an observer. Okay. If you're running a bath, if it's not being observed, it's going to overflow. Right. Right. So that would be called a balancing loop. Is it high enough? I'll leave it running. Is it getting too high? I'll turn it off. So a balancing loop is like, I'm going to hold it steady. A thermostat, like uh, if you have a thermostat, it's going, is it too hot? I'm going to turn it down. Is it too cold? I'm going to turn it up. That's a balancing loop. A feedback loop is where it tries to accelerate. So if you have a microphone, sound goes in, it goes out the speaker, it comes through louder, and it's a feedback. So, it, uh, so you, there's two loops, something that feeds back and something that balances. Okay, But regardless of which, because different systems might need different ones, for example, on on something generating money for your operation, you probably want a feedback loop because you're like, okay, we'll reinvest that money and get a new clients through ads. And then we're going to invest that in, you know, the money we get off that is you know, going to reinvest that and it gets bigger and bigger. So that's a feedback loop. Okay. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, some systems need balancing, some need feedback, but the point is it needs an observer. So what your role is, as a as an entrepreneur, as a, a musician, take it, anyone trying to take independence and control of their destiny is essentially, and I feel like I'm making it cold, like to try and put engineering on it, but this is You're true. Like, actually, I find systems. it systems. Really, you you orbit the systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the point is, you, you, like, if you want to take charge of it, 
you have to you, you have to observe and watch a system in order to control it because if it's not being watched it just doesn't exist okay yeah so so people who take your courses are going to now have the means to observe and identify that oh they have maybe an audience that already exists maybe they do have engagement and video views but because they haven't taken charge of observing and therefore deciding how to balance or feedback that growth then it hasn't grown before now you're saying right hey you do have a video views audience for example okay and you do have this stock of people viewing 75 percent of the video and now you're going to consciously understand how to design an inflow to that which is i'm going to put that video in certain placements okay and also i'm going to consciously understand how to reduce the outflow so i'm going to make sure i retain attention from that audience by retargeting them. okay so the point is Becoming an observer is absolutely crucial. If you want to go, if you want to go back to even stories of the Egyptians or even the oldest stories in humankind, you always have this position of a. There's always this. Um, there's this archetypal character of the eye watching, um, and that's because, and that's the leader of the state of the organization. The reason they're that in that position, and reason they're in charge or in, in the top of the pyramid. Uh, is and you'll see this on Egyptian stuff all the way through to the United States. It's the eye of uh, eye of yeah. Horus, I believe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like what it's saying is actually <laughs> is actually. Oh yeah, um, pyramids are a hierarchy. Pyramids are a hierarchy, and the eye observes the hierarchy. Hierarchies are just a system. It's a defined, you know. Okay, this is this is the the variable of com competence. If you're more competent in it you're higher in the pyramid. Yes, yes, but you can't yeah. be competent if you're not like watching. That's the first thing. The first thing is to even yeah. observe. So anyway, anyway, the point is the world like is, you start you, when you when the one of the first things you said earlier was um people might start out feeling powerless and oppressed of the system. It's like no, the first step is to recognize you're not powerless. There are infinite ways to intervene okay yeah um what you have to start with is understand what you want and then understand what what resource would it take just hypothetically just explore it's like what would i need to just do the first step and then figure out what could where could that come from and just even going through that process of starting to decide what you're aiming at is the first thing and and then it turns out as you as when you open your eyes to it and you stop saying i'm oppressed the system the world's like no 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 the system is that like so much has not been observed, so much has not been grabbed, and it needs people um, with good values and integrity to go and take charge of it. Because guess what? The assholes out there, they are playing that game. So go play the game. Just go and play the game. And it doesn't matter if you play the small game, but it's yeah. like, let's all take part. And, it's, and, and, the, and, and the world, uh, yeah, I, I genuinely think it ends up better off by taking part because it's not an oppressive system. It's actually a system that's wide open for you to intervene with. And God bless Facebook for giving us the scale and scope and reach of Coca-Cola 10 years ago, because yeah. I could not have done this stuff if it wasn't for like, yeah, sure. I had certain fortunate connections and stuff made, but Facebook has given us that power and clout. And so, yes, you can intervene, um, especially with the tools you've got today. It's so much easier today. So people are so lucky to have training from people like you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like it, it's constantly becoming more democratized to intervene and create systems. And I think just to bring it all home, like when I was younger, I, I saw the system and it wasn't because I was wrong. It wasn't because of any of that. It, it, it was all that I, I was perceiving or I was mischaracterizing the system. I saw it as one container with one input, one outflow and one arbiter. Mm. But really it's, a, it's, it's untold trillions of them of containers and outflows. And, and so by misunderstanding that, I thought there's one arbiter of this system. I can't break into it. No one can. But over time, I started to learn to intervene upon the container and subdivide containers, which yeah. I think is all, you can understand all of marketing by just subdividing containers. It's like you, okay. The reason you're shitty at marketing is because you think you have a fan base, but you don't, you have different containers within that. Mm. And the whole goal is to, before the input reaches the outflow, 
intervene on the container and bring it to another one that's more valuable to you. In all of business, it's that. Yeah, it, it basically is. And, it, you know, I, I, it's, I feel like I need to figure out maybe some like really accessible terminology that makes it really easy to grasp. But it really is like key go in, out, and then someone's watching the damn yeah. thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's kind of it. So actually, so I, I, I think if anyone is kind of in, interested in exploring that, like there's a really good book called Thinking in Systems by Danella Meadows, who unfortunately died like 20 years ago, but she was so prescient. She, um, she wrote this book. It's super accessible. It explains the world in so many degrees. I had absolute revelation after revelation um, with this book. Um, everything she was saying about the climate um, back then is proven true because, you know, she knew about systems. She knew like, hey, the inflow of like bad stuff in the environment is going to cause these things because this is just how systems work. It helps explain politics. I mean, yeah, absolutely awesome. But as a marketer, I think very much in terms of flows, like an audience is in certain states, you know, they're coming in. They're a cold audience and then they identify themselves as interested in your artist or maybe in a certain release or video from an artist it might be that they don't like some one thing so it's like okay you might have four or five videos at the cold end and they'll come in they might not care about these three but then this one does draw them in you know what i mean and and then there is the value of having multiple inputs is that the same input does not work for all potential participants of the system so you need to address all of them why throttle why throttle it why throttle yourself like yeah People are like, should I be on? Because people will say, like, should I be on this platform or this platform? It's like, it's like, yes, yes, you should be on this one, and maybe you should be on it. It's like, it's not, it's not yeah. this one. It's like, yes, you should be on these platforms. Yeah, whichever ones you want. Like, 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 if you if your time is not limited, all of them. If your time is limited, the one that you're best at until you've got it handled, yeah. and then the next one. So yeah, like the same. That thing. is important because you have. You, like, the fact is, we don't have infinite resources and time. You have to make compromises, but you know what? Um, I think I used to be really victim to this was like assuming before you actually try that you'll be limited by some factor. Well, right? th- there's that. And then there's also like, Oh, I want to do the perfect way of doing it. And I haven't figured it all out. And I, I don't know which is the best to do. It's like, look, 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 it, trust me. I've had to, I've had to like do like, cause we don't just work in music, working like regular business world as well, which has been an asset. And like, you know, I, I can talk about that later, but, um, when you're doing like really complex, say technical SEO audits, like there's no way that you can rank it from one to a hundred in priority. You go, no, no, no. Here's, here's priority level one. It's like must do priority level Tears. two, probably yeah. good to do. If you got time Priority level three, it's like, you'll be fine if you don't do it. It's like, like if it's getting too complex, simplify the level of resolution. All right. I think that's probably Sub-divide. the mindset that uh, Elon Increase Musk Increase the is. resolution. It's, it's a, it's an important skill in, in everything it's like a component of what I think you're describing here is like the ability to classify and subdivide is a huge asset. Mm. I I was going to say a little theory I've just had on like Elon Musk's cyber truck on Tesla's cyber truck. Cause it's like a low resolution truck, like literally low polygon. And it's almost like that helps them get the damn thing out the door. right? Right. And it also keeps expectations low because as as ugly as it almost initially seems, I kind of get the Mad Max and like you know custom spray thing that might probably happen with it. But um, um, and also the fact that it'll attract like rednecks who are like, I love my truck, and it's like, oh no, I've got a truck that's awesome in an apocalypse. But um, right. But, but um, I think uh, what it, it's almost like they've started low res. I could be wrong here. Like, just bear with me. It's like they've started low resolution, so now they could go any direction. Because I, I imagine that it's almost like the polygon count is going to increase on that vehicle so that in the next version, it'll be like more detail. And then in 10 years, it'll be like the sleek or 20 years, the sleek, like, but they have options on like in which way that's going to kind of rasterize itself. Do you know what I mean? It's like, um, yeah. so you start low resolution to get the damn thing out the door, you know? Yeah. Uh, Jordan Peterson says, if you want to improve your life, start at the lowest possible yeah. level of resolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, like clean your room. He's about yeah, like yeah, yeah just yeah. start there. It's not even about cleaning your room. It's like look, just take charge of something. Because guess what, you've taken that first step, and now there's going to be another step. Um, yeah, it's about momentum. You can't have perfect. You can't go to 100 miles an hour in a second. 
you have to start with something. So if anyone is ever like, oh, I don't know whether to do this platform or that, it's like, look, look, just start with the simplest thing that looks like a good bet, okay? Categorize it as, a, this seems like a must do, this seems like a maybe do, and this stuff is like, well, if it's not a, if you could survive without it, it's like, that, just don't even put it on your radar until you've got further down the list, okay? Keep life simple, and, and you'll, that momentum will start to feed back on itself. In the same way I said earlier, you might grow a company by, or grow an, an act by reinvesting the money in growth. Well, it started with reinvesting a small amount. And then that, that, that has this compounding effect where you kind of get steeper growth. And it's like, okay, if you start with simple activity, make simple decisions, you'll actually start to get these accelerating returns. And yeah. That goes way beyond marketing. I think that's just like, you know, useful principles um, for anyone. Since we last spoke, I've been thinking about, because I had, I've been thinking more and more about how like almost all creative fields start start for you linear because you just can't like, if you want to learn guitar, you have to start at the lowest possible level of resolution. You have to start at, can I play, can I actually strum it? Yeah. And then it's like, all right, now I'm going to try to do like notes or like riffs. And then it's like, now I'm gonna try to learn chords. And then for a long time, you can learn chords, learn riffs, work on your hands and, you know, just go through it. But at some point in all creative fields, including marketing, it loses its linearity. And people aren't comfortable with that. And that's why a yeah. lot of people have trouble with it. Cause we, we had this indie Joe who he ran our fan finder, you know, strategy, which is very step-by-step, -step, like paint by numbers, like do this thing, then that thing, very linear. And, but it's not intended to like make you think that all marketing is going to, or can be like that. And he was, you know, he had gotten like these huge results from his fan finder, but he was like, I don't know what to do now. Mm. And I kind of explained to him like, just like guitar at a certain point, it's going to be not what do I do, but what do I want to do yeah. or what can I do? Because like, there is no, just like you said, like you can't rank order SEO tasks one to a hundred, you know, you can't rank order the next thing to do for your marketing or, or which systems to install or how your overall marketing system works. You have to just, and just like music production, it's like, no, there's no right synth to use for the drums you selected. Find one that sounds good to you or a couple and choose from them. You know, like there's no right answer necessarily. That's a really good point because it's not like there's a single curriculum for, well, here's marketing and, you know, I've got to level eight on marketing. It's not like, a, you know, getting a black belt in jujitsu. It's like, well, here's the belts in order and here's the kind of things. It's like, no, no, it's wide open and people can be paralyzed by that. I think just to help Joe, because there can be, I think there can be principles that help reveal the next best thing to do. So in, was it Joe? Sorry. Joe. Yeah. Joe. So, so, so in his case, and, and we have this scenario, sometimes it's like, Oh, we built an audience, something, uh, you know, at the cold end really surprised us. And maybe we want to like better utilize that. So we might go, well, here's the question. I think it's like, what's the next best thing for the audience to experience? And that's going to dictate it. Um, I think it really helped. What's the next container? We have our container yeah. of cold audience now warm. Mm. What container are we going to siphon off to? Yes. That's the next, that's the next step in any mark. I feel like that's what I'm most commonly doing is like, what is our inflow to get into another container? That's more. Yeah. Valid? And and you could almost say like, there's a, you know, it, it is important to understand what you want out of this at the end. Like what's the, What's the ultimate thing we want them to do? You might say, oh, I want them to buy our music. So it's like, okay, well, you know that there's a pop you want to get them to at the end, which in Facebook audience terms would be purchased. Right. Or repurchased or whatever. It's like, okay, right, that's the end goal. Now we can actually make sure that we are going to keep the map going that way because there's a million things you could do. And, you know, so you could just keep going, oh, I'm going to keep, I'm going to show them another video. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you only ever have people cycling around like watching a video and actually never creating a path for them through to that purchase, like it's just not going to happen. The behavior is not going to happen at the scale that you want. So you have to consciously like work your way towards that. Now it doesn't mean that, Oh, cold audience is going to jump straight to cart. That's why we don't send cold audience straight to a cart. That's why we give them a fan finder or something to collect at the cold end. Right. You know, we like, I mean, not like it's rocket science, but, you know, like uh, digital advertisers in this space, like you and I have essentially come to the same conclusion. It's like video is great at collecting audiences. It's not great for clicks in my experience. It's not bad, but static ads are awesome for clicks. Some nine to 12 minute videos are 
great for clicks. exactly like hey guess what you might have few people getting to 10 minutes but the ones who do are so hyper qualified but anyway to, just on the uh um uh audience flow thing i think a useful i think a useful exercise to people who maybe get in that position or want to design a basic funnel would be well you, you start with what you want at the other end and you think, right, what's, how could we qualify the right kind of people? So, okay, if I, music is almost easy. It's like if they like the music or the video or the look or the brand, it's going to collect the right kind of people. So that's, that's great. And all the strategies that, you know, they'll be learning through your courses are going to give them a great method for that. But if they're wondering what next, then it might be, okay, well, seeing one video doesn't mean they're ready to buy. Okay, well, what would? Okay, I guess you could say, hypothetically, someone who watched three videos may – you know, that's a pretty strong signal of intent. Maybe I'll start making an offer to them or call, you know, offer to give them, a, you know, collect their email as a lead. So it's like the next best behavior is simply asking if they want um, to join your mailing list or whatever. It's like there's a chain of behaviors. Go, all right, I'll do it on Post-its. I'll do it in bullets. But I'm going to put those behaviors in order because you can kind of, you know, there is like, uh, you could say it's like a ladder of increasing commitment, okay? It might be, oh, I've passively seen 10 seconds of your video in the feed. And people might go, ah, oh, 10-second video is useless. Like, I actually quite like 10-second audience because I know they stop scrolling. It's not perfect. I know there's more... But it's some, It's better than never having sc- seen it. Yeah, It's that seed. It's like, it. Yeah. I, I know that if I isolate a 10-second audience and reach them again with some cold content then now they have the history of having seen us before. So, yeah. so then the odds of them converting increases. And some people jump ahead. They don't just watch 10 seconds. They might watch the whole thing and they might go and view a product. Yeah. So we call those, this whole thing you're describing, we call the buddy system. Yeah. And, and what you're, what you just described, we call automatic buddies, which is like, it's great. You can't build a business on it, but some people will just see your video and like go buy something. Yes. You know? Yeah. And, and it's good to kind of keep and retain them because over time they will in, develop that relationship. They will continue conducting behaviors that put some more on the path to being that fan or customer or tour ticket buyer. So, so you want to retain them. And so it is, I mean, like we could talk a million strategies, but yeah, I think a lot of this, I think we talked is tying together in kind of cool ways. I think it's super helpful just to like this whole thing I think is really helpful to because we talk about this stuff all the time, but in our own vernacular and to come at it from this like, you know, terminology agnostic way is I think super helpful, but just to like bring it home to something that like Indies might have heard us talk about in the past, like the whole point of our heuristic, the buddy system is that subdividing of containers is to say is to say, okay, well, your ideal business result is this, is that someone not only buys all your products every year, but also is willing to like get you new fans by their network. And it's like, okay, getting someone there is not a single ad process. And I think all, everyone learns marketing, their first lesson is like, you know, the different stages, What whatever, like some people subdivide it into three. I think that's the minimum that's the, that's the lowest resolution you can use on it is like, um, is aware of you, lead and customer, right? Like three buckets, but you can subdivide those as well and sometimes get great results out of it. But we think of it more as like, instead of thinking of 75% video viewer, ad click, subscriber, uh, opens and clicks your emails, buyer, repeat buyer, let's think of these in terms of the the psychology of where they're at, right? So because you, 75% video viewers is sometimes just as good as certain website visitors, is sometimes just as good as certain, um, you know, followers on social media. So there's a lot of different ways to get an audience that's kind of in that same level of awareness. And the point is understanding where people are psychologically. Like if they've watched 75% of your video or if they read a blog article or if they followed you on social media, they're pretty much around the same place. Like, and so you can build that that's building more inflows. It's like, look at your container and look at it at a psychological level, you know, and, and find all the ways that you can get people to that level. And just like you said, begin with the end in mind and figure out the, the different steps that make sense on the way there. So yeah, like, I don't know how we got here, but I think it's a super, it's a great way of looking at it. That's that systems approach. I really love that. Um, I don't want to, we're all, I mean, 
the time flies whenever I'm talking yeah. to you, but I want to make sure that I get your trajectory from the studio to where you are now. So tell me that story. <laughs> okay. Well, the main notes are running that studio. Uh, meanwhile, I'm kind of on Twitter a lot and so, and I start blogging and I'm blogging a lot about, yeah, I'm t- sort of tweeting and blogging about music technology, but also in particular about Apple. And so, and, you know, Twitter was a smaller community back then and, you know, you had almost direct reach to other influential types of early adopted type people. So I was kind of quite friendly with a lot of editors um, at like publications. So I ended up, I was writing for like Gizmodo and Wired and CNET and stuff just about like just Apple and technology and internet technology theories. Uh, oh God, I can't remember so long ago. Um, and and then that blo- and then I was running the new section on Ultimate Guitar and 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 that was when I started getting marketing because you know some of these publications you have to start doing basic SEO on titles like it's stupid SEO is I think there's probably an old tweet of mine probably that says well, something SEO mean about done. SEO and uh, <laughs> but I started doing it like in particular on the Ultimate Guitar new section and like the traffic went nuts. We were a little bit clickbaity, but it was kind of it was it was all kind of good fun. There's the kind of in jokes with the commenters. There's a few in jokes that I kind of established there. So if any of your listeners are ultimate guitar people, then there's a few uh, classic memes from a few years ago. On ah, oh, anyway, sorry, that's really <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the traffic went nuts. Started getting really into SEO. Um, meanwhile, I it didn't say, um, but I was doing a lot of memes, like anonymous memes, and like things and that are very well known. The, the virus information you had learned in yes. university came in. Yeah, play, I right? should touch on that. So one of the things I studied at university was uh, around that DC scene, actually. It's like the, uh, basically I did a paper on the viral properties of the punk, of punk culture. And so I looked at actual viruses. Not, sorry, not real viruses, like virus science. And it turns out like a virus basically identifies an agent – and then it uses that agent to propagate itself. So a virus would find a cell and then it would self-propagate by using that cell to kind of propagate. Which also ties in, you know, you find a, you find an, an inflow yeah. and siphon off resources to your own container. Well, well actually, so yeah, but there's a very important dynamic in viruses is that it's exponential because you infect one thing and if it infects two, like more than one thing itself, then it, 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 it the viral coefficient. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and that was really interesting. And in music, it's like, okay, um, influencing an individual to become not just a buyer, but actually it goes further than just someone becoming a customer. It's about them becoming an advocate because then that fan goes and recruits you to fans or 10 fans. And that's, like, you know, what your body system lead, leads towards. And that's a feedback loop. That is an accelerating system. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that thing of studying viruses, like so, I did a few memes that people will have seen, uh, you know, pulling like three hundred thousand hits in a day, and I kind of like it was very hit and run off, like making money off say uh, ads against the YouTube video or uh, against a kind of a landing page because I used to like make make like a homepage for a meme that someone else like there might be something else that's taking off, and if you're on Twitter enough, you kind of see this stuff early. So if you imagine imagine you got markets or imagine something takes off and it goes viral, and it's like suddenly everyone sees it and then it dies down. If you can get involved quite early, then you get to ride that full wave and you can actually kind of yeah. own traffic. So a news organization will do this. If they write the news soon enough, then they pull the, the, you know, they'll attract more of that traffic. And if you got in on early on the genre, then you'd be a kind of influential figure in that genre. And so what I was doing is like, oh, something's taking off. I'm going to grab the domain name for whatever people are calling the thing. And I'm going to put ads against it. And also like, I was kind of like a bit of a, you know, thought myself a bit of a comedian. And it was funny. You know, and, I, and it's, uh, you know, I did a lot of like uh, things on Twitter that were kind of uh, fictional characters, but from TV. I think it was the first one to do that sort of thing. So my point is, I was doing all this viral stuff. And so I was addicted to traffic. I was like really addicted to traffic and analytics, but I was doing it all anonymously. So I was like. But it's also like maybe your first taste of like, I know Kung Fu. Like I. I'm yeah, like I'm good at something. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And also like having all you know grown up with the internet it was also like yeah like i can i can i can i can uh this is a game i can play you know that's what i was talking about before is like you never really realize it 
up until the moment where you're like, oh, I'm perfectly suited for this. Yeah. I never realized it, but it, the moment that I was like, the, I'm actually, this is right for me. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're like, it's fun. You're getting that addictive kick. It's using technical skills. It's something else, you know, you could learn and figure out. Like, there was resources online, but you could figure out your own stuff. I mean, particularly back then, like, it was wide open to sort of innovate on, you know, it feels like a lot of ideas are very tapped out, but... I think that's always the case, but just uh, something gets saturated with people telling you, this is the right thing to do. It's not that it's any less uh, uh, platform to be developed on. It's just that there's more people dissuading you from doing your own. Yeah. Stuff. And you know, yeah. I keep being proven wrong as well, because um, like say 2011, I remember thinking, you know, cause uh, YouTube was getting big in like, I don't know, was it 2006, seven, eight? Um, and, I, and it was like, Oh, could start, you know, maybe we should start publishing videos. And you're like, Oh, I've missed it. And in 2011, I started, you know, getting success anonymously, but getting, you know, quite successful online. Um, through these kind of pseudonyms. There's there's no way to be early to something without being late to something else. Well, well yeah, I was going to say, I, st- I remember looking at YouTube going, oh, maybe I should do something on that channel because I'm kind of all about the Twitter and the stuff. And I did a few bits and bobs on YouTube, but like uh, under other accounts, but I was like, maybe I should do more of a thing. I was like, oh, fuck, I've missed it. Now, I had a friend right. who s- started getting into YouTube in 2011. If you now search for how to learn guitar, he's like the main guy. He's called Andy Guitar. And he's like the guy on YouTube for learning guitar. He's got tens of right. millions of views on like all sorts. And he's just like a guy at my university, lovely guy. He's a great engineer, live engineer in particular. And he, uh, he started in 2011. He's like one of the biggest like music channels on the whole internet, you know? So Alt Shift X, um, who does Game of Thrones videos, I got to know him quite early and I taught him keyword research and it served him very well. And he has like a million subscribers doing all these Game of Thrones videos and like theory videos. He was like the, one of the big main like root, uh, like theory channels. So it's like, it's not too late. He started that in like 2007. So it might look too late. It's like, no, no, no. If you can figure out that way to innovate and, and that makes it sound hard. If you can figure out an, uh, an audience waiting to happen, then you can go siphon that off and own it. But sometimes it's not like, this is such a teachable moment because a lot of people, their problem is I, they're not starting. They, they're they gaining knowledge. They're learning how to do it, but they're not starting. And a lot of times the assumption is I'm too late, but it's not that it's not that other people aren't too late. Like other people got in early. They just saw the thing that they were early for before they saw the thing that they're late for. Mm. So it's like, for instance, like, like, starting on YouTube literally this year, like we did, and we're up to like 6,000 subscribers. If I just keep doing it and work my ass off in four years, we'll have been early to whatever we're then participating in. But if I had looked at it and said, oh, YouTube as a thing, I'm late to. It's like, yeah, that's obvious. (laughs) There's always that. There's always the thing that you're late to. But if you just start and you don't stop, you're eventually the thing that you were early. Yeah, you, it, it is. It is within your power to create a market. Any any successful channel or other format has created that market. Okay, what you have to do is you test the ideas on what 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 works as an inflow, right? So Alt Shift X, who does Game of Thrones videos, let's just say, and I think he did, like he did sort of videos on other channels, and he's probably trying other programs he probably tried out like this program that program that program and then the game of thrones it just bit because it turns out there was a big flow of audience that did care and it turned out there weren't lots of competing cha- i don't know exactly i'm just giving an illustration of how this kind of thing can play out um right. it might be that there weren't lots of other game of thrones channels and the theory channels necessarily so something gets recommended a bit and he's like ah i found the siphon off this audio you know siphoning off audience and traffic from this platform that has millions of visits or billions of visits a day. And so I found a route to kind of siphon that off into my corner of YouTube. And, uh, and, and then of course it self fulfills because then people talk about it and they show their friends. So it's like, wait, 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 it's not too late. You might be early for the thing that you can find a market for. Just try some small bets and you'll get the signals that tell you if that's something you can accelerate and feedback on. Okay. So these small bets are not necessarily hard to produce. Everyone's got a laptop now might just need a phone, okay? If you can figure out what problems or desires people have, and this you can start by going, hey, here's what I'm good at. List the things you're into, then put it in a grid. Look, here's what you do. Do a cross on a piece of paper, go market size. And this is an important thing I did, actually. I went, right, here's things I'm into. Recording, uh, reading, um, this topic, that topic, uh, SEO, 
social media, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, on what you do across, and then you go, right, on one axis, I'm going to do few people care, lots of people care. And then on the other axis, I'm going to go, people pay very little, people pay a lot. And then you go pop your interests into a quadrant in there, okay? Even if it's just your best bet. Yeah. And then you go, damn. Well, here's what I did. I went, hmm, SEO and advertising is – Lots of people want it and they'll pay a lot for it. So I started doing that and here I am. So, but right. <laughs> with respect, well, one thing that went in the, the passion project corner, which is low market and don't want to pay was community music, right? community recording. Shoot. I'm not saying not to do it. It's fine to have a passion project, but if the goal is support your family, yeah. then it starts looking a little different. And it doesn't mean it has to be bad because you're leading with the interests you have. And it, yeah, anyway, you know, going on. It's time. really a, a lot of what, like I tell people and I, it's something I'm, I'm trying to find the right heuristic for to eventually describe in a more elegant way, but it's like get in a trench that you can sleep in, eat in, everything happens. Yeah. There, and then stay there and fight from the trench. So like, like for instance, like, you know, independent music marketing, probably lower left quadrant. Right. You know, but for me, you know, like people, I would say maybe more middle, right? It's definitely not the... Well, so, so, so there are four quadrants. So just to be clear, it could be that, okay, they might pay... It, it might be that the other two are... They might pay little, but there's millions and millions and millions of people in that market, okay? And right. it might be... And then just, just fill out the grid. It would be, oh, there's not many people who want it, but they'll pay a lot for it. And that's like, oh, you're billionaires in Monaco or, you know... So, so it's like, look, it doesn't mean any of the quadrants are wrong. It's just at least you can have a conscious decision about what you're pursuing. So as you say, in independent music, it might be, okay, it's not like they're paying, you know, five or 10 grand a month retainers, but there is it's 100 not million zero. people in the audience potentially, and therefore that's where the scale comes from, right? Absolutely, totally. And, and But all I mean to say is that like, just because you're not in the top right quadrant doesn't mean that you can't do things you never imagined. It's just that you have to be willing to get into that trench and not panic ever. Don't ever panic. Just yeah, keep yeah. doing the thing, keep iterating and get into a point where you can just change one thing every day, not millions of variables every day. And if you can get into that trench, you can do so much with things that are not necessarily in the top right. That is, yeah, yeah. And what you just said is is what happened to me because I then committed to this. I, I got one year, I just like the only proper job I had. I, I went to an agency for one year um, I found myself to be quite good at generating their money and I did ra I raise their average order value by a fair bit just by kind of introducing a content strategy. So then the websites suddenly didn't have this content problem and they were like, oh, it's another 20% on every bloody order we're doing. So so anyway, I spent a year there just to, to learn a bit more and then I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go out on my own. But something happened because there was a part of me and there was a moment and I was like, right, this is what I'm committing to. I'm going to master this. And I was like, do I want to master being a digital marketer? It's like, is this what I'm going to be? I thought I was going to be like doing music and kind of or influencing or inspiring stuff. Or I don't know. I just kind of wanted to create and influence people in the same way that I was influenced. But I, I dug into that trench and I was like, I, I pushed, I pushed on. And actually something happened because I started to really figure this stuff out and I started to feel good. Like I'm good at it. And I started to, get that traffic that I was addicted to. And I started to generate that revenue for other people and change their businesses. And then I start, and all sorts happened by the way, I'm not even working in music at this point. Okay. I'm working in regular business, which is a great training ground for any advertising. Okay. Right. And e-commerce and stuff. And uh, right at the early wave of Facebook. So just for context, one of the reasons we kind of became reasonably well known and it was just by being in slightly earlier wave of people who were kind of getting good and getting case studies. Late to digital advertising but early to Facebook advertising. Yes. Yes. We're like decades late for, uh, for <laughs> Google ads. Yeah. So our wave was like the Facebook wave and we helped figure this stuff out. And, you know, we contributed to the communities and talked about it online and, you know, I'm good friends with some of the other like absolute killers and, you know, pleased to have, you know, connected with you over this stuff. And, you know, so, but it doesn't, these, this isn't the end. Okay. And it's not even that Facebook's finished. It's just that if you've got that life cycle of, Facebook ads, it might be like, okay, we're definitely in, in the majority market up here now. Okay. And so cool. I got to ride the way, but it doesn't mean like there's still loads of market to work with. And there's other, there's, you know, if someone's new to this, that, that there's new innovations that needs to happen. Okay. And it's ripe for you to figure out what next, because there's a lot of people in these games 
who are like they, they want they want new strategies and ideas across other channels. Well, just the fact that we're potentially on the downslope literally means yeah yeah we're in late majority some, uh, that yeah, a, yeah. that a new wave is coming that you can be early to. That's literally what it means. So look out for it because if you get too hung up on like old strategy, you don't have your ear to the ground. So stay in these kind of the nerdy communities because they're those early adopters. They they clock stuff first. I. I keep I, I let a gentleman work out of my office, 21 year old musician. Uh doesn't want to be known for like his marketing efforts. But I I give him free office space to work out of every day because cause for that exact reason. He's doing all the things that I already have some kind of dogma about. Mm. Or, you know, like and he breaks down those dogmas. So being in those communities where you can be with people who are innovating at the front lines is huge. Mm. Um yeah. I think just to try and wrap up that story was I got into start the business and that was a bit, was like, do I want this? Was this what I thought I'd be? Um, but I now had three kids. So, but then it was, you know, when you, like I started, to, you know, when you, when you start cracking stuff and you keep cracking, you get those accelerating returns and it, you know, it soon, you know, it felt like, yeah, I am meant to do this. It's the perfect combination of, you know, start getting into entertainment through management companies, in fact, not even labels. Um, and now we're across all sorts of entertainment, not even, you know, including film, theater, doing like Le Mis, we work with Dynamo the Magician. We do, we, we, with music, we've got like The Cure, BTS, Coldplay, Khalid, Nick Cave. Right. Um, it's insane. It's insane. Like, I, sh I didn't need to worry about a damn thing. I just had to plug on with d being my best at my best bet. Okay. Cause it wasn't like, I was like, I'm going to be a marketer. It was like, right. What am I interested in out of all the things? What's my best bet? And what can I do to try out that bet? And then like, you know, you, st when you start getting feedback on something and it starts working, then fine, go help accelerate it. Be the feedback loop. You know, it's easy to answer that question of like, do I really want to be this? For me, it was like, anytime I've ever asked that question, it's like my, my way of snapping out of it has been like, Two years ago, you would have asked yourself, do I really want to be this? And at some point, that question was, do I really want to be a failure for the rest of my life? So don't go thinking that the thing you're worried you're going to be is going to be the same in two years. Because in two years, you're not going to be this thing that you're worried about forever. Yeah. Especially if you're you're changing at such a rate, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then here we are. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I think that... So tell me... Tell me about media buying for the music industry coming from a world of business media buying and what are the differences? All right. In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, it's principally the same. I have the same broad strategy broadly, which is collect an audience. So there you go. Whatever cold strategies, um, convert the audience. So that'll be all about call to action and retain those pools, like we're saying. So retain them with engagement campaigns. By the way, congratulate. You mentioned Nick Cave, and you said that last time, and I've been seeing all these awesome reviews for his album. album. of the decade. Absolutely yeah. amazing. So congrats, yeah. <laughs> it is like top rated on Metacritic, yeah. Uh, I didn't yeah. make the album, but thank you. Um, <laughs> Obviously, yeah, yeah, but you helped, you helped well, roll uh, it out. Nick's actually really interesting. I'll, I'll briefly talk about Nick and why it's more interesting than people maybe giving... Well, people have recognized. I don't think they've necessarily noticed how damn smart his whole thing is. But um, right, the differences are like, uh, sorry, there's commonalities. You have to collect an audience. You have to identify and qualify them. For a regular business, you've got to go. And as the artist gets more mature, I just said this on a consult right before this podcast. I was talking to a woman who's high up in hip hop. And I was like, typically, as we deal with artists who are more advanced, the differences shrink. But if they're earlier on, the differences are pretty vast because we can't just go to cold traffic with a product offer like we could with a business, you know, like that's not, not really a huge option. No, no, us, I, so. I know what you're saying, but I think, um, I mean, I'm, we can't be alone in this, but I, I, if, when we're working on more regular business, we actually treat it a lot the same, like very passive, um, non-salesy cold ads to definitely like it. This is such an important principle, and you, we're all doing it. Anyone involved in Facebook ads today is doing it. But, like, I think one of the things that we like by thinking about stuff in these terms, like in these kind of systems terms, and you know, increasing uh, behavioral kind of commitment was 
identifying that you could be collecting warm audiences. And we, you know, we kind of were fortunate enough to kind of crack and figure that out a while ago because it was like by not using salesy stuff at the cold end, we were curating a really high value warm audience and getting crazy results. There's this business called Flashpack that we grew like 400% year on year. It was like the fastest growing startup in the UK. We're driving like 70% of their revenue every month with Facebook. And it was like right. held 11 times return for a couple of years and took them to 13 million in like up to last April. And it's like, that was by curating a killer warm audience. And you do that by having re- like really strong creative at the cold end, obviously, but in strong, relevant creative, because if you had, let's say you put something at the cold end, that was like some catchy meme that everyone's going to watch because it's like a kitten exploding or something. Then it's like really told you much. If you, if you put it out there, maybe creates like brand recognition, but hasn't told you much about how that user feels that, about that, you that is, what you offer. That is true. That is true. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a slightly different point where if it's so catchy that anyone is going to see it, it like anyone's going to stick around and watch it because they've got to see what happens. You've now diluted the warm audience. So if I'm doing something for a travel company, so Flashpack was a travel company, what is a travel company for solo travelers in their thirties and forties. Obviously I'm going to target singles, divorced, etc., in their thirties and forties. But now I need to check that they actually care for this kind of travel. So the thing that works there was it didn't look like an ad. It was basically a blog post by the founder, picture of her sat on the beach and it goes, I, and it goes quote mark. I was single in my thirties, tired of my job and desperate for a getaway dot, 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 end quote. Uh. <laughs> now, if you relate to that, you're going to click the damn thing. And if you don't respond to that kind of, you know, the, the messaging or the brand, you carry on scrolling. Great. I don't want the people who don't interact with that. I want the people who directly identify with that because not only are you in the right age range and you're single and therefore you qualify, but you also, you completely identify with the kind of state of mind of who they're trying to reach. And that's why true marketing is not necessarily the tactical activity. That's almost a a lead generation or lead conversion activity. True marketing is like really deeply understanding who you're going at, where they are, where is a bit more demographic, but who and why they buy. And, and so Flashpack was, you know, although we did killer ad buying for them and like literally like awesome, like even case Facebook's used this, this as a case study, but, um, it, it's because the founders deeply understood their audience and they're like, look, we understand the audience. They are fed up of their job. They might be making good, they're making great money. Like they could have targeted in the audience, but they're like, our audience is a metropolitan audience. They're in a high powered job, but they're single and are kind of like fed up in living in the city. And that's important because right. they're like, right, we targeted a high value audience, golden goose corner of that matrix. Um, but we understand their problem because they do have a problem. And that is, Look, they're busy and they've, they've chosen a career over a family, for example, but um, but they're tired of their job and damn, they're not in their 20s having fun anymore. Like, damn, like maybe they need to mix up their life. And and that's where Flashback came in. So they started with this. Sorry, just to come back to my point is the cold ad. Well, that was the, one of the main cold ad angles. We did loads of variants of that, but it was hyper relevant to the right kind of people. And so I think just the core of any of our strategies is about curating a high quality warm audience. And so you want something at the cold end that the right people will care about. And music is a little easier because the music or the video may speak for itself. If they're not into the music, they're not sticking around. And that's why your models of like, you know, retargeting lookalikes or, or sorry, hitting lookalikes of 75% viewers or retargeting those viewers. It works. So music almost has it easier than businesses. So those are the differences on creative opportunities. Um, it's a little harder for a business to not be maybe salesy, but it can be done. And flashback with, Blog content was a good example. So Nick Cave, these end of year things you're seeing um, will be using as um, as ad content because because it's relevant. Um, it, people don't clock that it's an ad, but you might be like, oh, that's album of the decade, is it? I might as well click and have a look. And they might not buy the thing, but we got them in the audience because they're interested in high caliber music. And Nick's album qualifies for that with like 99% on Metacritic or whatever it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it kind of, so, okay. So for me dealing with, when, when I deal with working with like major managers or major record labels, 
I usually have to sort of like mediate or uh, liaison that bridge between business marketing and music marketing. But it seems to me like you actually run business marketing like we might run music marketing, which is like, let's do a lot of separation of audience at the top. Let's bury the conversion deep into the journey. You know, let's really not let's really not push any kind of radar or like alarm sensing action right now. Broadly, yeah, I just want to say, like, I, it's still worth trying call to actions at cold end and it can work and it might not. And it's like, it's not like I don't do it. I, I think it's just, we, we kind of figured early on that the sale can start at the warm bit. For example, if you've got, um, let's say it costs you, uh, like, let's say it costs you like three pence to capture someone in a, a warm audience as a, so a 10 second view or a, a 15 second true view. Right. And then it, the warm audience might click through to your site for 20 pence each. So the combined cost of getting them to site is 23 pence, but the cold end, if you just ran a call to action to get traffic to the site, it might be 50 pence. So it's like, well, it's cheaper to get them to jump through the cold engagement hoop. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not writing off doing the cold engagement because it can outperform, but it's almost like it can be cheaper to, to run two ads at an audience. And you can demonstrably see that. What's the cost to acquire audience to my warm audience cost per person, which we usually do based on like cost per video view or cost per engagement. It used to be really heavy on engagement campaigns. Not so much now. And you, you deal with scale a lot more than the average musician might. So you might be more like, look, we need to maintain this CPA and this traffic source is better than this one, but both of them combined is under the CPA and we need scale. So let's not count out the traffic source. And that's, I think that's in the mindset that maybe I sort of learned from business world a bit that obviously, you know, more established markets like yourself really get, but I think a lot of people it's, it's easy math, but it's important to get that because um, understanding that ladder of cost to get someone right to the bottom is your combined cost. And yeah. by looking at it with that view, by stepping back and looking at that view, then you can actually realize, oh man, it's cheaper to do maybe an extra activity, which is not intuitive at all. And if you depend on intuition, you won't come to that. And I think a lot of classic media buyers will be, I mean, they're starting to wake up because people like us are just taking their business because it's easy. They're big clients of Coca-Cola's and we're like, hey, we're cheaper than them and we do a better service. And then entertainment world comes to businesses like ours who are more boutique. But anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's helpful to actually step back and go, oh, you could get them to jump through three hoops. And, you know, on Flashpack, you were getting, you were selling a holiday from people abandoning the checkout for like two pounds each. It's like, that's like a 5,000 times return on ad spend. Yeah. But you had to get them to the checkout and that required blog content to get them into site, retarget to get them to site. My ear pods are probably going to die soon, by the way, so we might need to wrap up. But, um, <laughs> yeah, apologies. I'm just, Mike moved, so... uh Mic's out of battery, so I'll just wrap up on the kind of laptop mic. So um, yeah. my point is, I did, did, you know, that funnel for the business is the same way I approach it on music. And it doesn't matter if it's small artists that we're breaking um, or big artists releasing films. You know, we the same model that broke records with Metallica recently, broke records with BTS. Um, same thing that I'll do for a plumber in my town, all right? It's the same approach. What's the next best thing I can get them to do? And on e-commerce, I love e-commerce because it's a there's very clear steps. It's like get to site, go to category page, go to product, yeah, it's, go it's to a check. lot more linear than other other areas. It is linear. I just want to point out, it's not like I make them go through every step. Okay, so I'll just give one example. If you've been on the website, just the home page, but not the product page, I want to take you to the next step, but I'm also going to try and take you to a further step. So it might be like, okay. Not be cold audience. Let's run videos at them. Let's try and get them to the homepage. And let's also maybe try pushing a product, uh, a trip or a product or whatever. If they jump ahead, then that's great. I don't want them to go through every step and adding needless costs. But if they do abandon at any point, then there's a means to route them back in. And again, it goes back to these flows. The return path. That's what we call it. The return, return path. path. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So by putting these things in place, then you don't get a leak in that bit of the system going to nowhere. You're watching, okay? You have to watch this stuff. Taking responsibility of watching is what your value you are adding. So you're going to watch. Yeah. You're going to go, I see people leave here. 
I'm going to root them back in. I see a leak kit. I'm going to root that back in. I see that I can improve the throughput on this bit by adding another creative with a higher click-through rate. I'm going to put that here. I'm going to work on the website. I'm going to increase the conversion rate by being clear on messaging, who we do this for. I'm going to increase the, the throughput from the cold audience at the top by incre improving the relevance of the targeting, improving the caliber of what's going to attract them in the first place. Uh, there's so many levers you can pull. It's so accessible that anyone watching this or involved in this world is like, that we're living in the golden age. And it might not always be like this. And I think you've got to you know, capture and draw people into your pool as soon as you can because you might need to depend on owned channels like email a lot more in the future. And I think that's one thing I regret is not maybe developing more like the email marketing side. We Lead gen in music work. Email marketing's tight, man. I got to say, it's one I, oh, time and time again, it's always like, Oh man, I can't believe that that happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I keep thinking, oh, it's too yeah. late. It's like, no, it's not too late. It's like, no, not at all. It's too <clears throat> yeah. yeah, sooner is better. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. God, I could go on and on, but it's uh... absolutely. But yeah, so, okay, probably gonna have to put this in the beginning of it. We usually have a bit we put at the beginning before the theme music, but. What are the what are the music projects that you get to work on today? Just like in a list. Working on today, not like today, but like this year, you know. Um, Nick Cave, Depeche Badass. Mode. Badass. Um, <laughs> um, Les Miserables. Um, you also did work with Metallica last. Metallica, year, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's uh, Khalid. This is all music side of things. Um, we work with like man music management companies, so uh, things like right, so Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. I should have said right. like lots of independent music. Our clients have ended up releasing independently. We should talk about that again because I know we did on our first call. But yeah, um, um, Circle Waves, Two Door Cinema Club. Um, yeah, two, I've been seeing Two Door everywhere. Cool. One of my favorite YouTubers, he posted being at their show and stuff. And I was like, I know about them because of you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I lose track because some of the bigger projects, my team are just killer at covering. I almost um, trying to just run the business. I, I love all of it. And, I, you know, so you have to embrace these new games. But, yeah, music's been amazing. But also just, yeah, um, it's been important to expand beyond that into entertainment because... Um, yeah. yeah, like for me, the draw is the big consumer audiences rather than, oh, it's cool names. It's like, no, no, I, I enjoy working with big systems, obviously, given yeah. the conversation we've had. And big consumer audiences allow me to do that. So I don't feel limited to entertainment. I love working with consumer businesses. I'm not really into B2B at all. I kind of don't connect with it because it's small scale. I'd rather deal with the big scale, even if it's low transaction or high transaction, I'd rather deal with the scale. Facebook let's, is a playground for doing that. I love other ad channels, but Facebook's eight percent of what we do, and um, yeah. and entertainment and music and film happens to be like a really good environment to explore that because you kind of get really awesome credibility. So you don't have to get over the hump of persuading people. So you, so what we do get really good visibility on is the actual dynamics of large audiences when you don't have the throttling of oh they don't know this band, and so we get to sort of right. see how those audiences actually behave almost at a slightly scientific level because we, we don't have a filter of, oh, it's a brand new act necessarily to kind of, not that you could break a band, I'm not saying you can't, I'm saying it's almost like we remove that effect and we get to isolate and see, oh, what does a big audience behave like with this lever being called or this one? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It also delivers, it's, a, it's, a, it's the only playground in which you can deliver the promise of digital marketing for music, which is we can monetize better probably you know, because we have this sort of like these levers to pull. Um, that's, I know, I know this, this podcast could be 24 hours I, if, if we let it. Um, that said, like what I want to get sort of, because this whole time we've talked about stuff that's going to be relevant to any independent creative, but there's totally some independent musicians sitting here who might be like, do I become a d digital marketer? What do I do? And it's like, well, no, the point is, is that you have, I think you have control over what you want in life. And if you want it to be this music thing, there you, the same pathway could be taken, I think, to hacking that and building systems around that, especially with digital marketing. But sort of what would be your advice for people, like our average audience is independent musicians, music managers, people who are looking to deliver that promise of digital to their artistic or entertainment career. 
what would what advice would you have for them based on your journey? I think being clear about what would like what would it look like if you what would, what does the dream actually look like? And actually, like even if it's a bit of a fancy, it's actually worth describing, um, because then you actually have something to work towards. And I think you also just need to be honest about what activities you need to do. So, and I know independent musician, right? It's good music, um, but they don't like performing. And they keep recording as if like something's going to connect and something's going to land. And oh, some some manager was talking to me, and it's like, look, you're not giving. You, you need to place a few bets, okay? You need to do the performance thing. You need to do the collect the audience thing because if the vision is oh, I'm going to be a successful musician, it's like, well, what do they have in place? What got them there? Um, building momentum, building word of mouth, building these agents as, to propagate that that fandom to other people. It's like. Understand where you're trying to go and then go, well, what what, what did it require to get there? Oh, they had to be a medium size. Band. Okay, what did it require to get there? Oh, they, they toured quarterly. What did it take to get there? Oh, well they built um they focused, you know, they built they built a fan base in very specific markets, like the three nearest cities near them, by focusing ad spend and cold ad spend um, of their music videos right in that location. Oh, what do I do to do that? Well, I need a video and I need to understand how to deliver Facebook ads and I need to, you know, find a promoter. I don't know, you could, like, you can't work backwards and create a plan if you don't understand where you're trying to go with it. And I think also, if that sounds overwhelming, it's like, okay, well, do something that is somewhat in the right direction that you can manage and actually try and do a small handful of things like that because one of these bets will come good and then you've got something to kind of keep crawling towards. So uh, yeah, yeah give yourself good odds is the advice. I think that one heuristic that's helped me out a lot in life is like, if you don't like where you're at, do things that are new or if something's not working, do yeah, something new, the basically. cage. Yeah. So like, the, the reason momentum is important because literally if you have momentum, it means there were some things that you're doing that do work. So that's all momentum is, is it means some things you're doing work and you're still trying to figure out new things, but just getting there, like I think is so important. So I think that's, that's great advice is like everything we've said here about systems and engineering with the end in mind, totally helpful. But also at the, at the lowest possible level of resolution, it's like, you don't like what's going on right now change it now and do it in a way that has some a scientific method to it so you can measure did this help okay great keep doing that try some new things you know yeah yeah give yourself good odds yeah that's it absolutely man yeah so again such a great such a great podcast that we did it twice um you know i loved having you i would love to have you on any time uh you know anything you ever need from us please let us know and thank you so much for everything that you that you've been generous with during during this hour and a half i <laughs> enjoy talking we do this really in isolation there's no credit or thanks for it we have you know we have a good relationship with clients but you know it's almost like a thankless thing the the the, the thing we get out of it is thinking wow people are enjoying and finding this stuff at scale so it's actually kind of nice to actually even just uh talk about it and you know it's cool that, you know, you know, you being interested in this and, you know, hopefully your audience gets something out of it. Cause I think it's the, uh, yeah, I th yeah, it's, it's good that this experience. I know exactly what it's like, people. man. It's like solving puzzles. There's no, no one sh like applauds, but yeah. you feel clever. But when someone else is like, you're clever, you're like tight. <laughs> uh, and, and it can help yes. to be okay with like that internal, like pride of, Hey, no one's applauding, but. Yeah, like I achieved, I figured it out. And uh, I think maybe musicians might lean towards like wanting that um, obvious like praise, but like you're going to have to learn to pr practice, you know, those internal wins because it's going to take a few of them to have the diligence to do a few things that you need to do. So you need to be okay with that. You can't always just, it can't always be out, like outward. It's like, you know what? maybe figuring a few things out internally might open your eyes to like other rewards and it'll help you get there on the external rewards. So yeah, the hardest boxing matches are one with jabs and uh, dodges, not hooks, right? <laughs> so like jab, consider that a win, not a huge win, but it's there, it's under your belt. That's awesome, man. I'm gonna let you go. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it so much. <laughs> and we'll see you Indies next week on Creative Juice.